All right. Thank you, Kelsey. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so we are going to be rolling today talking about artificial intelligence, uh, AI, just in, in kind of in general, we're going to be uh, kind of discussing as much as we can in the hour that we have together today. So I'm very excited to to have this uh, time with you. And uh, as as Kelsey said, please, if you have questions, drop them in the chat, um, you know, because this is something that has a big, big big reach and i will do my best to save some time at the end uh of this for for some q a uh, that you guys can kind of ask those questions so uh as kelsey said my name is ben sangroth i am actually based out of illinois uh i'm in dixon illinois so a little south of you guys and uh i'm the lead regional education technology coordinator for the learning technology center of illinois you can find my email here so if you have questions you want to follow up um you know you can even reach out to kelsey and i'm, I'm happy to, to to answer those um, you can follow me on Twitter and you can locate my Instagram pages there if you want to get an insight into my my life uh, <laughs> there. Um, but uh, I want to jump into to AI here and uh, not talk about me as much because this is the important topic that we're here for. So um, our agenda for today. So what my goal is, is in the next hour uh, to talk to you guys about what is artificial intelligence. Um, I would like to just, just go into some history of it, talk about what it is, how it works, um, what what is going on in the world of AI right now? Uh, then we're going to look at some everyday uses for these tools. So in particular, we're going to focus in on chatbots. I'll elaborate on what those are. The two major ones that uh, we're going to look at are ChatGPT and Google's BART. Um, those are the two that you've probably heard of. There are several others that are out there. We'll talk about a lot of those as well, because it seems like everybody out there is trying to introduce some sort of AI tool right now. Um, and we'll talk about why that is, actually, when we talk about what AI is. And then we're going to wrap with uh, AI's limitations and challenges, because there are many. So um, it's an ambitious goal to get through in an hour. And uh, kind of as Kelsey and I were talking, that last part, that limitations and challenges part, it could be its own separate uh, hour-long webinar. So we might we might have to save a little bit of that for more detail uh, in the future. So uh, happy to be here with you guys. Happy to to talk about AI. It has been my favorite thing to talk about uh, as I work with educators uh, and just talk about it with my friends, with people, uh, you know, for the last several months. Uh, I've kind of been been knee deep in it uh, for the last, well, since December, uh, November and December of last year, and even a little bit before that as well, but mainly since November of last year. And it just has such an impact on, on everything that we do. Um, I use it daily. Um multiple times a day for both work and personal use. And we're going to get into those things too. So very excited to talk about this. Hope you guys get a lot out of this. Um, you can feel free to drop reactions in the chat. Like, you know, if you see something, you're like, whoa, that's crazy. I've got the chat up. You know, I'll be able to see it. Kelsey's monitoring that. She'll be able to drop in if something pressing. But please, if you have a question, drop it in the chat. We'll either address it in real time or we can wait till the end and we can address some of the bigger issues. So without further ado, got to start out with this question of what is... AI. What is artificial intelligence? Uh, that is the term that is being coined, that is being tossed around, um, the biggest buzzword ever. What is it? But before I answer what is AI, I'd actually like to throw a pop quiz into the chat uh, and ask you guys, if you could, if you have the chat open, if you don't have it, you don't want to mess around with it or whatever you're on your phone, that's fine. In the chat, I'd love for you guys to guess when, how long do you think AI has been around for? So throw that in the chat. When do you think you just just to name a year, a decade, if you will, how long has AI been around for? Got 10 years. We're going way back with a 1910, 50 years, 40 years, 1958. There we go. Uh, the definition of AI. So we're just gonna, I, yeah, I knew somebody was going to probably ask that. I'm just going more general out here, like artificial intelligence, you know, like machine learning, perhaps we could also put it at that. So we got some good guesses. Um, you guys, there are some of you that were very close. We're looking 2023 20, now. So um, really what we're actually looking at in our timeline here, we go all the way back to the 1950s uh, for this to come out. So actually in 1950, there's this guy named Alan Turing. And he publishes an article in 1950 that he proposes that machines can think for themselves or at least have the capability to learn and then make judgment based on that or make predictions based on that, I guess, rather than judgment. And 
this theory was pretty revolutionary because machines at this time, computers are obviously not in mass production by any means. They're very low. Uh, you know, the technology of the 1950s is obviously very much different than what we have today. But when this is proposed in the Turing test, it's pretty revolutionary. So those of you that predicted or went back, you know, 40, 50 years, you were close. You got to the 1950s when Alan Turing uh, writes his Turing test. And the reason I go through this brief history of AI right now is because I think it's important for us to kind of wrap our brains around that this is not a new thing. Like it's only been in the news for the last less than a year, but it's not new. It's been around for a very long time. In fact, we have Logic Theorist is our first AI program uh, in 1955. And what that did was that was a machine learning program that started to take data and then you could input data and then it would give you data back. Uh, and, and you could insert two different data sets, boom, it would give it back to you. It was mainly on logic. So it was like, um, you know, if this equals this, then what does that equal? And boom, spits it out for you. But then we have our first chat bot that actually comes out called Eliza. And Eliza comes out in 64. And Eliza, when that was released, that was pretty revolutionary because computers, again, very basic at this point in history. Uh, but it was programmed with a series of, of data sets that allowed the user that was using Eliza to input a chat, so input type something in, and then it would produce a response. It was just very limited because the producing production power of those computers back then was not very good. But that is the precursor to OpenAI, to ChatGPT, to Google's Bard, and all of those programs that we are using today. So pretty cool. It goes all the way back to 1964 for those. Then we have things that focus in on like the machine learning component of this. Okay. Uh, and we're going to get into what that is in a little while, but essentially what machine, when, you know, when we talk about this, we talk about being able for a machine to look at something and then predict what's going to happen next, which is autonomous automobiles. And NavLab actually produces the first autonomous automobile in 1986. Doesn't quite catch on, <laughs> very good, but we look now, we have Teslas, we have Waymo taxis, we have self-driving vehicles that use machine learning, that use autonomous uh, you know, drivers that are, you know, using AI to, 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 to drive around streets and to work. Uh, and those were, you know, being developed all the way back in 1986. The big ones, I think then as we get a little bit more into the last few years that, you know, within the last more recent history, we get Deep Blue being the supercomputer that wins at chess, beats a human, predicting the next move, uh, that was a big deal. I was 11 when that happened. And I remember that in the news, um, you know, as that was such a big deal. And we also have our speech recognition software comes around in about that same time frame in 1997. Now, what about our more recent stuff here? Okay. So we're again, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about technology that is essentially predicting and mimicking what actual human intelligence looks like to a point. Okay. And so this means that it's learning and then regurgitating things out, which is like your Roomba, which learns the floor plan of your house, goes back to its docking station to charge, and then goes out at a set time that you program it to, goes on those patterns, comes back, and charges. That's artificial intelligence. That's machine learning. That came out in 2002. That's something we a lot of people have in their in their homes right now. You've got AI in your home right now with that. The bigger ones here, we have Siri coming out in 2008. If you've got an iPhone, if you've got an Android phone, you can just say, hey, Google, same thing, right? We have this assistant that is able to help us with the tasks, that is able to learn what we like, what we don't like, and able to assist us with it. That's artificial intelligence. That's machine learning. IBM's Watson comes out in 2011. This is the big one, okay? So Watson gets released by IBM in 2011. And this is one that you guys have probably seen in commercials. You've seen Watson be advertised. Watson is a supercomputer. Watson is artificial intelligence. The reason why AI was not a big deal back in 2011 with Watson is because Watson's only available to companies that can afford to pay IBM for Watson. And most of those companies are giant healthcare systems, financial systems, uh, big corporations, and what the difference is, is that Watson is programmed specifically for those companies and for those organizations and the services that they support. Okay. So I want to ask it an education question. It might not know it because it's not programmed for that. But if it's programmed for a giant healthcare system, I can ask it a specific question about that healthcare system. Boom. It's going to spit it out because it's been preloaded with that information and it costs millions of dollars. Not exactly affordable for the general public to use. Alexa comes out in 2014. Those of you that have an Alexa in your home or a Google Home in your home, 
Uh, those are all artificial intelligence. My son who's six can go up and say, hey, Google, what's the weather? And the, spits it out. He can say, hey, Google, play uh, this song on Spotify. It starts playing it. Hey, Google, what do you recommend I wear today based on the weather? Boom, gives you a suggestion. That's artificial intelligence. So I wanted to start with this timeline because I think it's important for us to kind of recognize and understand that AI is, is here. It's been here for a long time. And in the chat, just to kind of engage you guys a little bit, if you guys can think of any other tools, now that we've kind of got this history going, uh, can you think of any other tools? You can put it out you know, for everybody to see there. What are some other tools that you, now that you kind of see where these things are, that you think, well, that might have something to do with AI. I think it'd be fun. So you can go ahead and drop that in the chat as we go. Um, now, what's the big deal with it right now? And that's that in 2022, uh, ChatGPT was launched by OpenAI. Okay, so OpenAI is a program uh, by Sam Altman, who was the founder and CEO of it. And he started this program and it's been around for a long time, but he released it to the public in 2022. And the reason why AI has become so big is because open AI wanted to release it for everybody for free. And so now we have this tool that was previously kind of safeguarded by major companies, corporations at a giant cost. It's now available to anybody. If you've got an internet connection, you can get on ChatGPT. You just have to log in and create an account. And that really upset the Apple cart because this previously, all of these AI systems were really limited to just these big companies and corporations. Now with OpenAI releasing ChatGPT to the general public in November of 2022, yeah, the, the, the wheels are they're out there. They're in motion for everybody to go. Um, so we've got a few good ones coming in. So Kelsey put in uh, the Canva uh, photo detail switching. Yeah, I've actually got Canva uh, on my, my presentation. I'll show you a little bit of that today. Another one with text prediction, 100%. If you're typing in a, a text on your phone and it's predicting at the top what it wants you to say, that's artificial intelligence doing that. Google does that now too. Um, uh, the refrigerator that tells you what you need on your shopping list. Absolutely. That's a really good one. Comes in with spell check, Grammarly. Like these are all AI tools that are helping us in our daily lives. And I think that's the biggest thing I want to get out today is that AI is here. It's been here and it's here to help. Okay. So what's the big deal with it right now? Okay. What is this thing that's been going on? Why are we doing it? What is it all about? You know, why is AI here, you know, to create a stir? And I think what I want to get out of the next 45 minutes that I have you guys here, you should have all the feels when you learn about this. So if you are pessimistic on AI right now, or you're a little leery of it, that's totally fine. I am not going to beat down the door here and say like, you should be all excited about AI when you leave this hour that we have together. I'd actually say you should be excited. You should be nervous. You should be impressed should be a little scared, maybe a little terrified, optimistic and pessimistic all at the same time. And I think that's totally fine. Like I am that and I use it every day and I'm always like, oh man, this is crazy. Okay. So, um, so when we do this, we have to know and understand a little bit more about the background of AI and how it works. So there are a few different ways that AI is currently being used. There's, uh, well, there's a lot of different ways. The ones that I'm going to focus on here mainly revolve around generative AI. So generative artificial intelligence, okay? And so what generative artificial intelligence is, is that this is when the artificial intelligence systems, the AI systems are producing new content. They're generating content for us, okay? So what this means is that these programs, these AI programs are all loaded with information. Okay, so they have been uploaded with data sets, trillions in some cases of data sets, which if you're like, Ben, what's a data set mean? I don't know. I read it on the internet, so it must be true. But I'm also going to say it's it's just like these numbers that are really hard to comprehend. So without getting super nerdy on you, we're going to say data sets, which is essentially like, okay, here's a book. We're going to learn that book and what's in that book. And that's now a data set that is in the system. So when you see that ChatGPT4 has been trained with 3 trillion parameters and data sets, it's been preloaded with that much information. And what it's able to do with that information is generate content based off of that information. So if I can break it down for you with how our human brain works, I learned, I was a history major in college. 
So I studied a lot of history. I then was able to read those books about those historical events and then be able to, when my professor gave me a test or asked me to write a paper, I was able to take that knowledge that I learned and put it on the paper as my own original thought and then turn that in. And then he would tell me, yes, you learned this. You learned this. Good job. A plus. Okay. So that's how the human brain works, right? AI is the same way. AI works in the fact that it is uploaded and trained with information. And then when I pose a question or a task to it, it is able to complete that task based off of that information that I gave it. Or in other words, generate something new. Okay. So we're going to look a lot at generative AI. We're going to get into some more detail of this as we go into a few more slides. Now, the one that everybody's kind of like freaking out a lot about right now is this natural language processing component of AI. And that's when the AI generative tool provides a human-like response back to you. So when I go into ChatGPT and I ask it a question, or I go into Google's Bard and I ask it a question, it converses with me. It sounds like there's a person on the other end. I'll give you an example. I'm going to go into Bard right now. We're going to open up a new chat. And this is Google's Bard. So this is Google's AI tool. Okay, so Bard is an AI tool that Google uses. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just ask it a question, say, uh, I am traveling to Jacksonville, Florida in three weeks. What are some fun spots that I should eat at when I am there? And so in a matter of seconds, it's going to now produce a conversation back with me. Here are some fun spots that you should eat while you're in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. So as I go down, it's going to give me all of these. These are just a few. I say, which one would you suggest as the best? And when we're talking about this natural language processing, I want to hone in on this because it wants to sound, as you can see in the definition I've given here, trained to interact with people the way we communicate. And now if you look at this, it says, I would recommend Chimney Creek as the best restaurant to eat. It gives me a response that if you were in Jacksonville, Florida, and you live there, and I emailed you or I texted you, and I said, hey, where should I eat? How would you respond? You would say, well, I would recommend going to this place. It's got these dishes. If you're looking for something more to eat, it's conversational. It sounds like there's another person back there that's answering the question for me. And that's the natural language processing component of this. Now, here's the deal. There's nobody on the other end. It's not a sentient being. It's There's not somebody on the back end of Google that's training and answering all these questions. It's the program that is using this information that's been uploaded to sound like a human, to interact with us in that natural language processing. The big thing here is now this next one is the refinability of this because it can be really bad at understanding how humans interact, even though it looks like it's doing something that's really good and it's asking you the right questions or it's answering the questions correctly in your opinion or what you basically know or don't know about it. However, you need to be able to refine it to make it so it's suggesting correct things. So as you can see, I actually refined this search because it gave me a bunch. I don't want a bunch. I want one, right? So in refining the search, I'm saying like, what's the best? It gives me what it considers to be the best, okay? And that's doing that based off of its own data that it's researching, that it's scanning, that it's going through, okay? So the refinability is something here that's really important when we talk about AI tools. If you ask these AI tools a general question, they're going to give you a general answer. If you ask them a specific question, they will give you a more specific answer. Uh, and we'll see some examples of that moving forward. And then the last thing that we're talking about generative AI is multimedia AI that's being generated. This is the, probably the part that scares people the most because AI is able to produce images, AI is able to produce video, AI is able to produce audio and text. So all of the modes that we communicate, all of the media that we communicate through, AI is now able to create. Now, is it always good? No. Is it getting better every day? Um, there is a, uh, a website, podcast.ai, that has AI conversations around celebrities that never existed. 
Uh, and so you can go in there and listen to Oprah talk. Oprah never did that podcast. You can listen to Joe Rogan interview Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is dead. At least we think he's dead. Uh, and that didn't happen, but they were able to do it. They're able to create deep fake images uh, that are troublingly accurate. So you can see this is where we get into some stuff that's a little sketchy. However, on the positive side of this, like all of these pictures in generative AI are generated by AI that I'm using right now. So if you look at my slides, except for some of those, of course, but all these four, I asked AI to create them. So I'm able to have pictures where I don't have to worry about violating like another artist's copyright by using their images because I generated those images using AI. Now we're going to get into the copyright thing in a little bit because that's kind of scary too. Um, but it's kind of cool too that I can just create these images, have them go. So, all right. How does AI work? Okay, so we've got our generative AI. I've explained it a little bit, but I think this is the best way to describe AI. And I have a six-year-old at home, so he loves Legos. We have a dining room table that might as well just be called a Lego table at this point, much to my wife's chagrin. But we have also have a 15-month-old, so we have to keep the Legos high or else they go in the mouth, and that's not good. So I want you to think about this. When I ask AI a question, so I asked Bard, my question here was, traveling to Jacksonville. Okay. Give me this thing. So what Bard does and what ChatGPT does is that it essentially has a box of Legos. There's all the different colored Legos, all the different sizes of Legos. And when you prompt AI to create something or to give you a response, what it's going to do is it's going to look at all of those Legos and know that each one of those Legos has a certain meaning to it. Okay. And then it's going to search through those because it knows every little bit of all those Legos. And it's going to try and build something out of those Legos that it thinks you want. This is the most important component about AI and understanding how it works is that it wants to please you. The machine wants to make you happy. It wants to give you what you, what it thinks you want out of its response. So it's going to say, if I say create a tree using a generative AI image tool, it's going to look at all these Legos. It's going to start putting them together. And it's going to try to create a tree to the best of what you want from that prompt. So when I ask it in a text prompt, what about the restaurants in Jacksonville? It's going to look for the Legos that are flagging Jacksonville restaurants and, you know, fun because I put fun spots. Right. So it's going to look for all those things and try to put it together. But we all know when after you build the initial Lego set and your son or daughter destroys said Lego set and the pieces go everywhere. It's tough to put that Lego back set back together correctly. And so the issue becomes that it might in its response, put the wrong Lego in and it's going to look bad or be incorrect, but it thinks it made what you want. So then you have to go to that refinability component and refine that search, ask it to be specific. What is the one spot I should go? What is the tree? Can you make a maple tree versus just a tree? Can you make a tree with roots instead of a tree that doesn't have roots? And those specific refinability questions bring the right Legos together to then create the response that you want. Okay. So I think that's a really like easy analogy or, you know, a less complex analogy perhaps uh, to understand how this AI tool works. So that's, that's good. Oh, and <laughs> Legos are all over the home and the floor of my grandson. Something. Yeah. I, We've been lucky so far. The, the little six-year-old's good at keeping the Legos up high. You know, I only have to dig one a month uh, or once every you know day or two out of the little boy's mouth. But yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a little bit about how our generative AI works. And then now we get into this. So where do the Legos come from? Okay, so this is kind of the really nerdy stuff here. Um, it's algorithms, it's data sets, uh, it's, it's all this background information. It's really important to know where does this information come from, okay? So when we talk about chat GPT, okay? So if I bring up a chat GPT window here, I actually don't use chat GPT on my personal account a whole lot. I actually use it more on my work account. I'm gonna show you some of those here in a little bit, but this is where you can see I've got the difference between Bard here and chat GPT here. These two tools work very differently, okay? So when you're thinking and you're hearing about ChatGPT and I ask ChatGPT a question. So I'm gonna ask ChatGPT a question, maybe that same one. Where should I eat in Jacksonville? I'm actually gonna, you know what? I'm gonna copy and paste that exact question in there so you can kind of see how the difference there. So I'm gonna copy that.
So we're getting some different answers here. You can see how ChatGPT is working now to produce this. You can also see that conversational tone, right? Absolutely. Jacksonville has this. That's the natural language processor. That's the system running. You also see it's giving me now over 10 different responses here versus what Bard gave me was, let's see, one, two, it gave me about five. And then now I'm curious if any were the same. It doesn't look like it. Now, I've also heard that Jacksonville has an awesome food scene. So there's probably lots of different places to eat. But you can see there's 10 here. I don't think I didn't look close, but it doesn't look like any of those 10 were the same as the five that Chet, uh, that Bard gave me. Reason being, when we go and look at this, ChatGPT and Bard work differently. They have been pre-programmed with a bunch of data. Okay, So they've learned a lot of stuff, just like we learn stuff. Humans learn things and are able to spit out information. These AI programs, these chatbots, these data tools are all programmed with information. They've all learned this. Where they get it from differs, okay? So that's one of the big issues when we're talking about machine learning and the tool that you're using is who uploaded that information and what up information did they upload into the system? ChatGPT doesn't search the internet. I'm gonna repeat that, ChatGPT does not search the internet. It only relies on the information that has been uploaded into its system. Now, a lot of that information came from the internet. That's true, but it doesn't do an active search. There's a reason for that. They want to, OpenAI's goal is to actually safeguard these AI systems by not allowing it to search the internet because they don't want to create uh, easily create fake news based off of relevant, timely information. So if I go into chat GPT here, out of the way, ah, there we go. If I go back into chat GPT, I'm going to create a new chat here. I'm going to say who won the Cubs game last night. It won't be able to tell me because ChatGPT is only up to speed on information through September of 2021. Now, if you pay for the upgraded ChatGPT 4, I think it goes into like April of 2022, um, which has way more information and also uploaded with a lot more information. But this is only relevant up to 2021 versus Bard. I do a new chat here. Who? won the Cubs game last night. It knows it because Bard, Google's tool, uses the internet and actually does active searches of the internet to provide information along with being pre-programmed with lots and lots of other information too, okay? So I bring this up because I think it's really important when we understand how these tools work, that you have to know where they're getting their information from. Is it being uploaded? Is it being searched by the internet? Are they, you know, who's in charge of uploading all that information? What information are they uploading? Uh, because the tools are only as good as the information that's been put into those tools. Uh, and also, and this goes into our limitations and challenges section and portion of this talk, but I'll jump ahead a little bit. Those people that are in charge of uploading that information, if they have the wrong motives or if they give access to the information and it can be messed with or they only have particular information that they're uploading because they don't have access to all of the information, the responses that the chatbot will give you, that the artificial intelligence and the, the, the reckonings that it will do and will come back with, those things are only going to be as good as the info that's in there. So I, I use this information as kind of a dark one, but I think it's really important to kind of get, like imagine uh, AI databases, chatbots back in Nazi Germany. If the Nazis were creating ChatGPT or a similar version of it, what would they upload into the system? Well, they would upload more than likely only pro-Nazi ideology information. If then they released that to the world, but they didn't put that blanket out there. People didn't know that they were the ones that were behind it. And you asked ChatGPT a question, 
it's or that Nazi version of it, I should say, it would give you pro Nazi information back or val or information that aligned with their bias. That's not good. So when we ask questions to ChatGPT, to Google's Bard, to Microsoft's Bing tool that's called Sydney, we have to be aware that the information that's coming in may contain some form of bias, okay? Um, be it based off of the information that it has or doesn't have. So it's interesting. Uh, again, we're going to maybe hopefully get into more detail of that in a little bit, but that's something we really have to learn because it works based off of the information it's given. I'll relate it back to the human brain again. I don't, I don't know a lot about, say, art history. I studied history, but I only took one semester of a class in art history. If I go to a museum, I'm not able to look at a painting and say, oh, that's this painting by this artist that is done at this time, and it's this style. I look at that painting, I go, hmm, that's a pretty cool painting. I'll be like, oh, that's a Picasso. Like, I know that because I know enough about it, but I'm not going to be able to give you a very detailed answer. However, if I go to watch a baseball game because I played college baseball, I coached college, I coached baseball, I taught swings, I gave individual lessons, and somebody asks me a question and they say, hey, break down that hitter's swing. Like, why did that happen there? I'd be like, well, it's because his hand placement was here and I can be very detailed in that analysis. Or golf courses. I'm, I play a lot of golf. I travel. I really kind of am obsessed with golf course architecture. Somebody says, well, why is that a good golf course? I said, well, let me tell you, because it was designed by Bill Corr and Ben Crenshaw. I can give you a lot of information on that because I've learned it. I've studied it. I've taken it all in. If I don't know something and I tell you about it, it's not any good because I don't know what I'm talking about, right? That's the same way that these chatbots work. That's the same way all these artificial intelligence systems work, okay? Um, the best way that it was described to me and actually, this is a, uh, and Kelsey, we can maybe drop this uh, YouTube video in the chat. I'm going to do a quick, like while I'm talking, uh, look up in my history here. Um, it was a professor, uh, I'm going to bring it up right now, because I think it's really important to, to do this and drop this in. So this was a, a talk from an AI conference uh, that uh, Chris Didi, who is a senior research fellow at Harvard Graduate School of Education, pretty smart guy, um, you know, because he works at Harvard. So we're just going to assume <laughs> I'm going to put this in the chat for people to kind of maybe look at and watch later. This is probably the best YouTube video I've watched of like somebody breaking down like AI. And one of the things he says is that even though with these machines and how they respond to us and these chatbots and Bard being responsive. So Chris Didi says here, he says, AI is a lot like a parrot. And I love this analogy. If you walk by a parrot and a parrot talks, probably want a cracker. Oh, somebody's at the door. You, you hear that parrot and you're like, whoa, like that was really cool. Like the parrot talked, it acknowledged something that happened. Then you have to ask the question, is that parrot intelligent? Or did that parrot just learn how to mimic how we talk? Does that parrot know what a door is? Does that parrot know... Like it knows it sees you. It knows your name maybe because it's learned that from listening to other people. But can that parrot intelligently have a conversation with you? And the answer is no. The parrot's not going to have an intelligent conversation because the parrot doesn't know what it's saying. But the parrot can talk or appear to talk, right? That's the same way that these chatbots work, okay? They appear to be knowledgeable. They appear to be sentient, but they don't have their own thoughts, okay? They can bring and regurgitate information, but they can't make judgment on information. So that's a big, big component of this and how these machines learn. They only really produce what they've been programmed to produce. And I think that's a really important, important thing to, to know about and, and to kind of understand. All right. Oh, and as I said, I spoiled this slide, but all of these pictures that we've seen so far have all been generated using AI. So none of these pictures are quote unquote real. They're all AI generation, uh, generative tools. Uh, using tools like Midjourney um, and Canva. So I actually use Canva quite a bit uh, to do this. And we're going to do an example of, of a, one of those image generations here in a little bit. All right. There's a lot for the first 30 minutes. Hopefully your brains aren't too exploding yet, but I'm sure they probably are. We're going to break it down with a couple of other quotes. Okay. So I really like this quote too. So what is AI all about? What can AI help us with? Okay, so uh, this was from Professor Toby Wall. She did a Reddit AMA and Ask Me Anything on AI back in the back in the wintertime. This was back in like December, January. 
And his quote came down to this, is that hopefully AI will do the four Ds, the dirty, dull, difficult, and dangerous. And that's where I think we, we land on all this stuff. So as I show you some examples here in the next 20 minutes uh, of how this works and what it does, you're going to see like, oh my gosh, like this is great. Like it'll do this for me. It'll do this for me. It'll do this. So like the dirty and the uh, the difficult or more like the dangerous, I guess, give you and you an example. The dangerous part of this, I have a friend who works at a nuclear power plant. They have a robot dog that is trained and they have it programmed to go in and go into the reactor area, take a reading of the radioactivity levels. And then that information is then sent and then compared to in an algorithm and machine learning to tell those people that are operating the reactor, is that at a level that needs to be adjusted? Like, do we need to make action because the radioactive levels have fluctuated? That's a dangerous job that the robot is now able to do on its own. The computer is determining where those levels are at. AI is helping with that. And then telling them what course of action they need to take based off of those levels. No human has to go in there and do that. That's huge. That's an awesome thing to help keep us safe, you know, and keep people safe that work in those reactors are able to go in and do that. You also have machine learning all over the place with this. Um, and I'm going to show you some of that in the past, but I thought this was a really good one. This was a good quote to kind of understand that. All right. Here's some industries that are doing those dull, dirty, and difficult things. Automotive industry, we've seen self-driving cars. If you haven't seen Waymo taxis, um, check them out. They're, they're approved for use out in the Bay Area right now. They're actually... Um, they're in, they're in some controversy because they are completely autonomous. They have no driver in them. Uh, they use machine learning and artificial intelligence to scan and have cameras all around to pick up where people are, stop signs, all that good stuff. It's really pretty fascinating to watch. I really want to ride in one. However, they're not great yet because they keep like, um, they like short circuit. They've caused traffic congestion because their cameras freak out. Also, there are some uh, activists that are out in the Bay Area that are figured out how to uh disrupt them because they think they're bad and so they have put orange traffic cones on the hood of the waymo taxis because the cameras on the top of the taxi pick up the orange traffic cone and it knows it's not supposed to go when it sees an orange traffic cone and if they put it on the hood the taxi is just rendered completely useless kind of funny um but it's just an example of now we have that um medical field this is actually a really interesting one so the medical field has uh uses ai to help diagnose you know any sort of complex disease, help find uh, cures, help find treatments. This is where we see like a big difference between AI helping, but then the doctor still being needed. And actually Chris Didi in that Harvard, uh, from Harvard, the one that I put that link in, had a really used a really great example of this. He calls it reckoning and judgment and why humans aren't going to be replaced completely by AI yet. And that's because what AI can do is if I put in a diagnosis, I say this patient is suffering from this type of cancer, how long do they have, what's their life expectancy? And the AI tool is going to bring in all their information, digest all that and say, this patient has six months to live. That's fine. That might be what the science or what the data says. However, the AI tool is not factoring in things like uh, that person's lifestyle. Where, do that, where does that person live? What are their spiritual beliefs? Do they want to under even undergo the treatment that the AI suggests? Do they have the tolerance for the pain that that treatment might suggest? Maybe they have a higher tolerance that could offer up a better uh, treatment that could extend their life expectancy out. The AI tool is not going to be able to do that, but it is going to at least be able to promote something that could help that doctor come to that uh, conclusion a little bit quicker. Um, gaming is giving us more realistic opponents because the AI is able to learn and, and go off this. Um, I think back to Star Trek in the holodecks when they would do like battle preparations and they would go in and, you know, all that. You know, it's just, that's, that's a nerd in me, but I think that's one of those things that's kind of cool. Um, agriculture, uh, analyzing all sorts of stuff from crop health to soil and water temperatures and, and pH levels and soil health in general, just all sorts of uh, uses in, in, in ag. Um, finance, my goodness, you know, it's really interesting. They can, you know, they can put in all these numbers and stuff into a chat bot or into an AI system and spit out information. Now, one of the things that I did just read an article on who was talking about using ChatGPT uh, versus a financial advisor, uh, the big difference was that the ChatGPT didn't quite understand what was going on. Like it was, it was making numbers wrong. It was doing things incorrectly. It wasn't taking into account that, you know, people have to have money to live. Like you can't just save $2,000 a month when you only make $2,500 a month. Um, so, you know, it, but it, there are complex systems 
that are out there that are, you know, really working the stock market and things like that. So super cool stuff. Uh, and then in entertainment, which is actually a big sticking point right now with the writer's strike, uh, because there are, a, there's a whole entire industry centered around deep fakes, uh, but then also putting them into practice in movies. If any of you watch the Irishman, you're able to watch our, you know, generate this generation's greatest actors in mob movies with Al Pacino and De Niro and um, all those guys. And they were de-aged. Like it was them as 80 year olds, but they looked like they were 40 or 30 and or younger. And they're able to go through and, and interact and, 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 but you couldn't tell, you know, or I'm a huge star Wars fan, you know, spoiler alert on the Mandalorian, but like we get Luke Skywalker back. It was Mark Hamill. And it's like, wait a second, Mark Hamill's old. That's young Luke Skywalker. Well, they deep faked his face. They changed his voice to sound like young Luke Skywalker. We're able to do that. Now, the scary part of this, again, going to our limitations and challenges section, and this is what the writer, big part of the writer strike is that these tools can create stories, can write scripts, can, you know, create uh, conversations that can happen, but they can also generate voice. They can generate facial features. They can generate images. And so the real fear here is that we can find a young Brad Pitt who is kind of hard up for cash and looking for a, a, just a, a supporting role have him come in. He sits down. We say, hey, read these lines. We're going to record you. And oh, by the way, I know you're starved for cash right now. So we're going to give you 500 bucks, but we're going to, we have the rights to these, your voice and the rights to your looks from now until eternity. And he's like, man, I just really need this money. Sure. Whatever. I'm not going to hit it big. Uh, you know, here it is. He reads a paragraph that AI system can now just generate any word that Brad Pitt and make it sound like Brad Pitt. It's really, it's really crazy. Carrie Fisher passes away in the middle of the previous Star Wars trilogy. They're able to bring her back based on use the words that she spoke in the original trilogy to create her voice in the ninth movie that comes out in 2018 or 2019. It's really nuts. So there's a lot of really cool stuff, but also some scary stuff um, that's coming through. All right. Here's some of our big names. Okay. So I really want to get in. We have about 15 minutes left. So I want to make sure that we, we kind of dive into what these things can do in a little bit more of examples here. Um, OpenAI has ChatGPT. That's the one we're going to dive into here in a second. Google's Bard. We've recognized that. Adobe Firefly. So Adobe Firefly is actually a tool that does image generation as well. It's only in beta, uh, but it is an image generation tool as well. Uh, Microsoft has uh, their Bing tool, which is called Sydney. And then they also offer Copilot, which is an add-on feature for their Office 365 uh, tools. So if you're using Office 365, you could have access to Copilot, which is your own personal assistant inside of uh, your Office tools. Uh, Meta is actually, so that's Facebook. They're releasing one called Llama. They say that's going to be free. I don't know. It has not got released yet. Of course, Elon's got to get into the AI game. He's got one called, spoiler alert, surprise, X. I don't know. We, who knows with him? Uh, and then Apple is releasing Apple Ajax uh, soon as well. It has not come out yet, but uh, it's supposed to be coming out soon. And that's allegedly supposed to be integrated with Siri too. So we'll see how that goes. All right. So let's look at this. We're going to look at how chatbots work. How can they make your life a little bit better? Okay. So chatbots are the ones that are those natural language processors. Okay. So how do these things work? Okay. I'm going to show some examples. I have some examples here. Um, that I want to do, but I want to really like get in and actually show you guys some of these, these tools here and how they work. Uh, so here's a couple of direct links. So there's one I, the other day, how do I use this in my everyday life? Okay. So how I use this, um, I actually use this one just the other day. I'm on my, uh, alumni association board of directors, uh, for my high school we had to write a 30 second advertising spot for the broadcast team that broadcasts all home football games and home basketball games. And I was like, man, I need something like good to use for this, you know, something different. So I put in this information and I said, rewrite this for a 30 second radio advertisement. And this was the one we did last year and it spit out. Tune in and be a part of something amazing. And I was like, eh, I don't really like that. Rewrite that in a paragraph form without the bullets listed. So it did, it rewrote it. I said, well, I'll shorten it because I was like, that's too long. Shorten it can be read in under 30 seconds. It did, but that's like two seconds. So, <laughs> you know, so you can see it's not great, but it did help because I actually took this, put it into a Google Doc and just adjusted it. And that's what I read for the spot. And so one of the key components of using these chatbots that I hope you guys will look at is saving time. 
Okay. They are here to save time for you. One of the other ways that I've shown that we uh, save a lot of time here is I use this to rewrite my session descriptions. So I do a lot of presenting and I want to like come up with new catchy titles, new descriptions, things like that. And so I have this session that is called Everyone's an Influencer, Bring the Social Media Influencer Style into Your Classroom. So I just asked it, rewrite that breakout session in less than 10 words. Influencer style in class, empowering everyone's social media impact. Yeah, cool. I like that. And then I say, okay, now write a, uh, here's this description though. Maybe I want something different. So write a title for this breakout session. So I actually gave it the description that I already had and then asked it to create a title for me. And so now from inspiration to influence, equipping students as social media managers. I don't really like that. So I keep asking it. You can see I'm going back and forth here with the bot. And it's a, it comes up with transforming classroom projects, embracing the influencer style. Ooh, that's a winner. Now, what new information will attendees learn from this session? This is where it gets crazy. I've just given it this little piece of information, settled on a title. And I said, give it, what were they going to learn? And it gave me seven bullet points of what attendees will learn from my session, from the content that I'm going to create that I did not give it. And I read these and I'm like, you know what? All seven of those are exactly what I'm going to cover in this session. Done. Copy, paste, submit, put it out there. Let people know what's coming. Save me a lot of time. Um, so some really cool like ways that you can have this work. It's, you know, I the other day I was curious. Here's another good example. Uh, we were here in the office. Like I've hung TVs on walls before. I've never hung a TV on metal studs. These office this office building is built with metal studs. So I was a little worried. Like, man, are these metal studs the same as wood studs? Turns out they're not. So I asked it, are there any concerns when hanging a TV mount on metal studs? It absolutely gave me eight different concerns about having to mount a TV on metal studs versus wood studs. Some stuff I would have never considered, like the depth of the studs are going to be different. You know, I've never worked with metal studs before. This was able to give me that response, save me time, save me. I think here's the big thing as we kind of wrap up so we can get some more questions in. Save me having to go out and Google this information and find a blog post that's seven pages long. It's considerably shorter to do it this way, right? All right, a couple of other examples here. I'm going to go back over to Bard. This is the one that I use a lot. Okay, so one of the things that I uh, use here, let's see if I can find some of these. I was having a debate uh, with my buddy on who was more uh, important to country music right now, Hardy or Morgan Wallen. And he's like, oh, Hardy's more this genre and Morgan Wallen's more this. I'm like, dude, Hardy wrote almost all of Morgan Wallen's songs. So you can't tell me Hardy is hard rock and not country when he wrote all of Morgan Wallen's number one hits. So I asked it, what songs have Hardy written that have made it on the charts? Gave me a whole list. It's pretty cool. Boom. I won the debate. <laughs> it was great. Um, and then, uh, you know, doing other things like um, I wanted to know some stuff the other day about, uh, you know, I'm hitting putts off my heel the putter right now. So what's going on with that? You know, I, I don't have anybody that's a golf pro that I can ask. I was bored sitting at home. My old family went to bed, just me hanging out. So gave me a list of ideas on how I can stop hitting putts off the heel of my putter. Um, it does a lot, a lot of stuff really, really, really well, including doing summaries, doing explanations. Um, you can ask it to do things like explain how uh, the heat dome or how a, explain how a high pressure weather system Uh, effects weather in the summer. As like, you're typing that, Ben, I was going to say one of the ways I've heard that it has been creatively used is if you look in your fridge and trying to decide what to do for dinner one night, you can type in your ingredients and it will tell you recipes that include those ingredients. So let me give you this example here, Kelsey, because that's a really good one. And one of the things, if we look at this, um, See, I use it a lot. You can see we've got a lot going on over here. Uh, there we go. I asked it, what is a good pulled pork rub? 
because we've all gone to Pinterest and we've looked for a recipe, right? And every Pinterest recipe is the best one of all time. It's the greatest recipe you've ever had in your entire life, right? I just wanted to know what a good pulled pork, rub, pulled pork rub was. So it gave me this. Here it is. Here's the basic recipe. Here's the instructions on how to do it. Do this. And then I actually like had a different chat open about how to cook it. I tell you what, folks, this is the best pulled pork, pulled pork I'd ever made. Like I make pulled pork like once a year. This pulled pork was unbelievable. And Bard gave me the recipe. I just was lazy. I could have gone to Pinterest, but it would have taken forever. I just asked Bard, what is it? Boom. Gave it to me. Unbelievable. Like so, so, so very good. So there are just so many cool ways that this can open up, like, and you know, allow you to do things. It is your smart Google chat. Okay. So it's your best way to get information quickly, timely, efficiently. You're not having to look around. You can have data that you can put in there. Um, if you write code in any capacity, um, I can go in here and I can say, write a code for a Tello drone to fly in a square in Python. So a Tello drone is a drone that we use in education and actually have kids learn how to code. And if I, I don't know how to code in Python, but now I can take this code, copy it, put it into the system, and now I've got the code to do it, which is pretty, pretty darn cool. Um, okay, so there's a lot of different use cases here. I'm, uh, you guys, I'm, I'm telling you, like the, one of the big things is to, to get in, play with it, experiment with it, ask it questions. But here's the one of the big limitations. Okay, um, as we go through, and again, we could definitely do a part two here. Uh, one of the big limitations is that it has this thing that is called hallucinations. So this is the scary part uh, about this, is that what hallucinations are, and all AI tools suffer from these things, is that it will just flat out make up stuff. Because if we go back to how I was explaining it at the start, it wants to be right. It wants to tell you what you want it to hear, what you want to hear. And in some cases, if it doesn't know, or it can't find it in its data sets that it's been programmed with, it's just going to make it up. And it's going to tell you that, and it's going to sound very confident in doing it. AI is a lot like arguing with my six-year-old or even just talking to my six-year-old because my six-year-old will tell me things like, did you know that the most poisonous spider lives in Africa and is a tarantula? And I'll be like, no, I didn't know that. Where did you learn that from? And he'll be like, well, I just know. And I'm like, well, I don't think that's true. And he'll be like, no, it is. I'm like, well, how did you learn it? Yeah, I just know. Yeah, yeah, okay, I know you just know, but like, it's just not right either. Here's where this has actually come to bite people in the butt. There is a, uh, there was a, a law a lawyer that uh, submitted a brief in New Jersey and he used ChatGPT to write the brief. When he submitted it to the judge, the judge threw the case out because the brief that he filed cited five court cases that didn't exist. ChatGPT just made him up to sound right. So they lost the case and was pretty well scolded for it too, because it just made it up. And there's a great 60 minutes uh, on AI. Uh, it's about Google's Bard uh, and they recognize this uh, and they say, yeah, we don't really know. It's a, it's a problem and we don't know why it does it other than the fact that it just wants to be correct at all times. So that's a pretty big limitation, pretty big challenge. And also the biggest thing about this is that you cannot take this stuff that ChatGPT gives you, the stuff that Bard gives you and use it as gospel. It might be wrong. You have to be very, very careful about that. Um, there is a, a great you know, example of this. I asked it to give me a list of all of the school districts that I work with in this one particular region. It left off an entire town and in, act, in fact told me that, I, that that ROE was in another county completely. It just wasn't even close. And that's all information that's readily available on the internet. It was just wrong. So while I use this and I say it's really neat to like help speed up processes, it is not the end all. It is not the greatest thing ever. It, it's close, but it's not going to do your job for you. Um, you know, it, it's going to definitely like be wrong and incorrect. And that's where we want to make sure you ask it specifically what you want it to know, and then it will give you more specific answers. So my kind of some of my last parting thoughts here is we do have, you know, I do have several other things that I wanted to hopefully get to. Um, 
is that we have to be careful with this. Okay. So it's going to be interesting on how, you know, moving forward, this continues to evolve. They continue to actually, some people are saying that the programs are getting dumber, uh, which is interesting uh, in large part, because if it gives me an answer, I can thumb up or thumb down that response. And if there are some people out there that are thumbs down in correct responses or thumbs upping incorrect responses, the machine is learning from that. Like if, if this is good and I give it a thumbs up, I'm telling the machine, I'm telling the chat GPT, good job. You did that. So it thinks it's right. So it's going to repeat that same process over again. But what if I had never even tried this code before and that code doesn't work, but I thumbs upped it. I just told it it was right when it was wrong. And then it's going to spit that information out potentially again that could make it wrong for somebody else. So um, there's a lot of concerns here. So uh, I do think, uh, Kelsey, we should probably do a, uh, a second part 